Welcome to a cult of personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire at occultofpersonality.net. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. This is episode number 193, featuring an interview with Rudolf Berger, the co host of a cult of personality podcast and the host of the Thoth Hermes podcast. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to ChamberOfReflection.com, our membership site. Anathema Publishing Limited. Quality occult books and contemporary esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trinosophic relationship in troth and gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian Theosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com On May 1st, 1776, Adam Weishaupt founded the Order of the Bavarian Illuminati. Weishaupt's goal for the Order was to elevate society with the virtues of public education, the ideals of the Enlightenment, and the general liberty of humanity. In short, Weishaupt sought to illuminate the world. Now, over 240 years later, and for the first time in history, the collected works of Adam Weishaupt are being professionally translated into the English language and published in a 24-volume set produced by Malta Minerva Editions. To celebrate the 242nd anniversary of the Order's founding, we are pleased to announce Volume 1, Number 1, of the collected works of Adam Weishaupt will be available for pre-sale at MaltaMinervalEditions.com beginning in May 2018. To learn more, visit them on Facebook and Twitter at username MaltaMinerval or at MaltaMinervalEditions.com. A Cult of Personality podcast is also sponsored by Miskatonic Books, an online store that focuses on the esoteric, occult, ceremonial magic, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, witchcraft, the Golden Dawn, as well as dark fantasy, classic horror, and supernatural fiction. They carry books by all your favorite esoteric publishers as well. Just visit MiskatonicBooks.com. Rudolf Berger, known on the internet by his pseudonym Nothi Seton, is the producer and host of the Thoth Hermes podcast, which can be found at www.thothhermes.com. He can also be heard as my co host on the Occult of Personality podcast. Rudolph has been interested in the world of esotericism and occultism for over three decades. A Freemason for more than a quarter of a century and a member of the Scottish Rite, his first interest in esoteric sciences came about when reading books by Rudolf Steiner. Later, after experiences in shamanism, theosophy, and ritual magic, he broadened his knowledge and personal involvement to many fields of the Western esoteric tradition. Today, Rudolf calls himself a Gnostic Hermeticist, with a very strong link to ceremonial magic. 
He's also greatly interested in sacred geometry and the implication of sound and music in the occult arts. He is practicing the art mostly as a solitary worker, but maintains links to several occult groups. In the profane world, Rudolf has been working very successfully in the field of the performing arts. He initially trained as an actor, speaker, and opera singer, then mostly worked as an artistic director and producer in the world of classical music and opera. Recently, he quit the management field to place himself more extensively again on the creative side, mainly in writing and directing. And he has taken on the work of a funeral celebrant trying to help the bereaved by creating and leading personal ceremonies to honor their beloved ones. Rudolf lives near beautiful Vienna, Austria. You can contact him by email at info at thothermes.com on Facebook at facebook.com slash thpodcast, and Twitter at thothhermesat. The intro music is Awakening by Paul Avgerinos, and the outro music is Thought Talk by Deadleaf Echo. Rudolf, I want to welcome you to the podcast uh, I feel Thank odd you. welcoming you here since you're sort of already here, as it were. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, you are our guest this evening, so uh, welcome. Well, thank you, and I'm very honored to be with you tonight in that other capacity. Uh, but as you said, it's a bit odd because we are so much have gotten so much used to talk together to other people and well i'm very happy and excited to be your guest tonight absolutely as am i so maybe you could tell people a little bit about yourself um i think you know listeners yeah. are familiar with you already so um you know feel free to sure give us as much background as you'd like no sure well i'm as one can hear by my little accent, I'm from the German-speaking part of the world, from Austria, to be more precise. I'm 57 years old. And, well, esotericism, I would put it, has been part of my life or almost day-to-day -day life, one could say, for the last 20, 25 years, I would think. Probably from the moment when I started to want to become a Freemason. So that's almost 30 years now, to be precise. And over the years, this has developed much further, of course, it started, actually, it started with a bit of anthroposophy and shamanism, we can go into that a bit more in more in depth a bit later. And then, as I said, Freemasonry, and over the years, I discovered more and more things that I was interested in. And so uh, I would say for the last 10 to 12 years, I would call myself an active hermeticist or gnostic hermeticist, as I like to call myself, because if there is if one thing is sure for me, I don't like to be put in a certain category. I don't like that in general and not in the occultist or esoteric world either. So many things I'm interested in, several things I know a bit about and practice a lot. And as you know, Greg, and some of our listeners already know, because they might also listen to my Thoth Hermes podcast, um, I have decided a couple of years ago to want to be more active and more outgoing regarding this. And now for about seven months, I have opened my own podcast. And for, well, it's already a year, Greg, that we are doing this together here on Occult of Personality, which makes me very happy and proud to be your co-host here on, on other evenings. <laughs> and um, so the this world of the occult and esotericism is becoming more and more important to me. Uh, professionally, I'm in the performing arts world. And 
it's funny, like over the last five to 10 years together with that further development with my search or me going more in depth into the questions of life, I would put it like that. Um, I also feel that my approach to my profession has changed and has become more critical to certain things and more interested in other parts of it. So there's a whole change going on. And I'm happy to say that at 57, I don't think I'm finished with that by far. And it's just the beginning. And there's lots of interesting things, I hope, to come. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there are. Yeah. So, well, thank you again for you know, it, 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 this past year has been really amazing. I think um, I feel much more comfortable, you know, doing the show with you, even than I did alone. Um, so I think that oh. uh, says a lot, and oh, I thank you. definitely appreciate all the help um, that you provide, not just <laughs> not during the interviews, but um, all the. Uh, the work you do behind the scenes that makes the show successful is uh, really crucial and uh, definitely should be acknowledged as well. Because I know that most listeners probably have no idea of the uh, the great amount of um, things that you do behind the scenes that um, that make the show successful. So I think we'd all appreciate that. Well, thank you. But when talking about my biography and about my occult esoteric background. I also need to say that without any, without wanting to be uh, especially nice to you, but uh, it is true that the last six or seven years before we got to know each other in person, a cult of personality has really been one of the um, regular things that have accompanied me and taught me so many things and made me discover so many interesting subjects and people. And I'm very grateful for that as well. Well, I really can't thank you enough for for that, and uh, I'm grateful to hear it too. Because you know, if it's helped uh, some people, um, I'm sure that you know there's others out there, and uh, oh, there are, certainly are others yeah. out there. I can attest for that. Yes. So it's all it's all very useful. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. I really feel grateful so to get back into talking about you mm -hmm. i'm freemasonry has been a large part of your journey yes and we've talked about it a few times um i'm wondering if you could describe the the ways that um, Freemasonry has affected you um, and some of your maybe accomplishments in that field, which I think are quite, yeah. you know, recognizable in some ways or should be. Well, I, I think most or many of our listeners here know that, of course, Freemasonry has different faces, different approaches you can take. And they vary not only by the way you approach it yourself, but also a bit by coincidence in which country you are and which country you have the opportunity to join Freemasonry, to become a Freemason, or as I would prefer to put it, to be initiated into Freemasonry. And here in my country, in Austria, we have a very special history because Freemasonry, most of the historical part of its official existence, it has been forbidden by the authorities first by, uh, by what, what was the Habsburg Empire. And then, of course, again, during World War II, um, it, it was impossible to be a Freemason in this country. And so Freemasonry in Austria is a bit more secretive than in uh, many other countries, but also maybe a bit more oriented to the development, social development and um, being integrated into society from, from its development side. And 
when I entered Freemasonry now, which is almost exactly 25 years ago, I was one of the very rare cases, at least here in this country, who did not know somebody who would come up to him and say, hey, do you not want to become a Freemason? Would you be interested? But in my case, it was me who wrote the letter to Grand Lodge and said, well, what do I have to do to become Freemason? And that special approach, um, I was lucky to find that a lodge found me and took me up. And I was very well guided in those first three or four years until I became a master mason. But I also discovered over the many years now, and it has gone in parallel with my personal development, that the part that I would call esoteric Freemasonry or spiritual Freemasonry is something you have to look for yourself. It's not obvious, it's not lying there by itself. And it took me several years to discover that that possibility really, well, I knew it existed, but I didn't know how to approach it. So I was very well received. I think I did, had very nice first years and got a thorough Masonic development and um, I was given the tools that I needed. And what was always very interesting to me personally, I, at the time when I was a young Mason, I had the opportunity to travel a lot across the world for my profession, North America and Europe mostly. And I always tried to visit uh, Masonic lodges in the places there I had to go. And that really taught me a lot about the differences, about different approaches, but also about that underlying knowledge of fraternity that when you go to a completely uh, city, a city you don't know, and you don't know anybody there, but you go to a lodge and you are among people who you know, who are your brethren and who you trust. And that's a very, very nice feeling, I must say. I was lucky to experience a lot of that. But over the years, as I said, I got more and more interested into the more underlying parts. Um, I am now also a member of the Scottish Rite and uh, also of an English lodge in London. So I'm rather active there and have now also, I'm also even now building up and trying to build up an esoteric circle within Austrian Grand Lodge. And I must say there is quite a lot of interest in that there are many brethren who are keen to discover new possibilities to work in Freemasonry. And that's a nice challenge. Maybe a last word about that. What sometimes upsets me a bit is that those two, I would call the main currents within Freemasonry, which are spiritual esoteric masonry on one side and more liberal and social, if you want to be um, a bit uh, naughty, you could even call it knife and fork masonry, as the British do sometimes, but the more outward oriented masonry, those two are often in opposition and they don't accept each other. And I think that's wrong. Personally, I need spiritual development to be also a good person. And uh, I don't think there's any opposition in that. You might be interested more in one than the other, but it's not an opposition. It's not two distinct currents. It's just two sides of the same coin for me. Well, that makes sense, I think. Thank you. Well, pleasure. So... I would be curious to hear about your experience getting into 
things like ceremonial magic and hermeticism, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. of where you live, uh, it's, it must have been somewhat, uh, different just because you don't necessarily have access to the same or as many, uh, esoteric lodges or things of that nature, I would have imagined. Yes, yes, we are absolutely right about that. Well, I believe that the reason why I was drawn into ceremonial magic and ritual magic has a lot to do with my professional background. If, if I may, Greg, I, I shall go back to the shamanism and anthroposophy part of it because yeah, that, please. in a way, explains also the next step into ceremonial magic, partly. Yeah, so. um, I, one of my very first contacts with the esoteric world in a practical way was through shamanism. It's just that I discovered it a bit on my own, like many of us with the books of Michael Harner and tried to do things myself and semantic journeys. I also joined a group here in Austria for some time. And I just felt that I had touched a field that spoke to me. And even today, sometimes I do in private some shamanic journeys from time to time. It it changes my energy level. It, it helps me in certain situations. And from there, I started looking around into other fields. And one, well, of course, it's mostly when you are in a place where, as you say, there are not so many groups around, you start reading books and searching for books. And I came across a occult personality who is, of course, very much rooted in the place where I live, who is Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner, also here, very well known through the schools that he developed, and there are quite a few schools of that type around here. And I started reading his books, actually starting with his books about teaching and schooling, because my kids started to come to the age where I should pick a school for them at the time. So I was interested and I discovered that Rudolf Steiner had much more to say to me than just about schools, which is already not so bad, but there is much more behind him. And I discovered a whole new world, his uh, theosophical approach and what he then made out of it for his, uh, his own, his own teachings and his own world. And I was very much into that for some years, then I came into Freemasonry, etc. So I needed that occult background, which I had, which had grown in me, a bit pagan, a bit occult. And you add to that the experience in Freemasonry, and then you add to that my professional background, which is theater. Right, um, which gave me, I believe, a deep understanding of ritual. I suddenly needed to find a way how I could structure that knowledge that I gained little by little. So, of course, Masonic ritual is also that kind of structure. And the ritual in the lodge is very important to me. But I wanted to go further than that and use techniques, knowledge, approaches that went much further than what masonry usually has to offer. And so, well, I looked around more and more through Steiner. I discovered other worlds and then I, well, you stumble over the Golden Dawn teachings, of course. I found out about Rosicrucianism through Amark, the classical way, what you do when you start looking around. But the fact that I live in a country where there are very few occult groupings and lodges on one hand, and on the other hand, that I'm probably also very much an individualist. 
I tried to find possibilities to do most of the work on my own with teachers from time to time, but more with teachings than with teachers and not so much with groups. And I must say that has developed over the last 10, 15 odd years further and further. I have my daily routines today. Probably wouldn't call that ceremonial magic anymore. It has become something of itself, but which has a lot of elements that initially come from ceremonial magic. I've learned enormously through books and teachings of people like John Michael Greer, for example, or Josephine McCarthy, who added that pepper that I needed to give its own flavor to the things, the personal flavor to the things that I had learned before. If I name those two, there are examples. There are a couple uh, more out there who I shouldn't probably forget to name now. But I, if I start naming everyone, then I'm sure to forget someone. And so I stop it here. <laughs> so my my day to day work world, ritual work world is very individual, but very regular. Uh, I have my morning working, which I do every day. And also most of the evenings I do something. And well, that that structures my day, that structures my week and my my year. And it's become extremely important to me to my well being. And I also think that I can live my life differently today because I have that and I have that approach and it's hopefully expanding, but in any case, developing every day. I feel it every day a little bit differently. Yeah, Rudolf Steiner is quite something. Yeah. I often feel that maybe not by everyone, but often that his work is underappreciated. Yeah, I, I would agree. Now, of course, the the picture that I have of him is the one I get here in a country which speaks his his language. And his language, when you read it in German, is extremely it's unique. It's when you start reading it, it's a bit difficult in the beginning to read. He uses a certain terminology and a certain way of building sentences that you have to get used to, even as a native speaker. But somehow, well, I very much believe in things like language and what it can express and what it, that it has particularities and, and even sometimes like a soul to it. But... So his language is very particular because after maybe 10 or 20 pages, you you get into it and it becomes easier to read. And suddenly you start understanding what he means through that way of language use. I don't know if, 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 if you can understand what I mean, but it's language is very much part of his teachings to me. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that makes sense. I think... In my opinion, all of the greatest teachers, um, that was, you know, part of an aspect of their teachings was the link, the language they used, the particular words they chose mm -hmm. and how those worked on the reader or the listener. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. And well, you saying listener, um, that's the interesting thing, as as you probably know, from a certain point onwards, he didn't re he didn't write his books anymore, but he only had lectures, and there were some people sitting there and taking down those lectures, and that's the way they were published. I think he corrected them uh, before they were actually published, but he didn't write those books after the first ten years or so. But 
the most interesting books to me out of his high 250 books or whatever have been published by him are the first maybe 10 where he still sat down and wrote them himself and where he lies, lays down the theory basically of what was to come later on. Mm. And when you say underestimated, I think that underestimation comes from a partial overrating by a certain group of people. Because, of course, anthroposophy is a, is a philosophical or esoteric current and its groups. And to me, I ha often have the feeling that those groups have stopped. Well, they take him like a guru and they take him literally in a way, almost fundamentalist way. And they oppose themselves to any further development of a man who has died almost a hundred years ago. And I think that's completely in opposition to his thought. Personally, I believe that. I think if he lived today, he would express things completely differently and have developed, of course, with the time. And because the, well, I don't mean that literally, I'm saying that a bit cynically, that the priests of anthroposophy, right? <laughs> they have kind of blocked that thought development. And that's maybe part of the reason why he's underestimated in many circles, because makes sense. if you just take him by his word and make your own, take your own thought out of it and put it into our time, I think He's he's really one of the very interesting writers and teachers and well as I said personally I learned a, I learned a number of very very important lessons from him. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, I would agree with your insights there. I know that the <clears throat> the whole guru thing just doesn't work if the person's not alive. So yeah, you can't use a book as the guru um, even though people may try to do it. I might have tried to do it in the past. Um, well, I'm sure I did myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So books like static so the, the teacher's dynamic, you know, a living being can like respond to you as opposed to a book which, you know, you can respond to it but like it can't do the same. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, in a way, that's happened to to many of the grand religions as well. I mean, don't I'm not comparing Rudolf Steiner to those people now, but it's the same process that happens when you start taking each word of prophetic texts, not to name any more, um, just literally, just literally, and not by their esoteric and in-depth sense, well, you stop any possibility of development. Hmm. It's a shame. Yeah. But that's but the way it is. <laughs> it's, it's human, probably. <laughs> Certainly. Certainly is. So, uh, I, hmm. I'm curious if you want to talk a little bit about your desire to talk to European based uh, mm. occultists and authors and teachers and uh, start your own podcast and yeah, what your goals and desires are with that. Yeah. Well, Steiner was a good, a good entry uh, door into that. I find it really fascinating and I think we all have to be very grateful for what, especially North America or let's say the English speaking world in general, but North America in particular have been doing and developing for the esoteric and occult realms over the last 50, 60 or even more so 150 years probably. And that's great. On the other hand, um, through 
probably partly through world history. And we also there we could go in more detail why um, the occult movements and the background, which is to a large extent European, has not well has lost a lot of its weight has lost a lot of its um, development and things they would have to say so when you when you go into the late 19th century or in the 19th century overall and early 20th even this whole part of the world where i live from austria north to prague into into germany berlin etc that whole access was very active, for example. So was France, right? There's a whole European tradition. Let's not forget about Italy or I mean, many, many, uh, many places where occult movements and esoteric movements have been have made very strong developments. And when I compare to that to what's happening here today, I it makes me a bit sad because I think we've given up a lot of that knowledge. And I'm not saying it's not good that it's been kept elsewhere, on the contrary, but why not doing ourselves as well? And when we speak about Rudolf Steiner, he's a very good example, but his work is basically still alive, but he's he's one of the few, I would say. And if you think that Vienna has been together with Prague at some point, for example, the center of alchemistic work, what's left over except of a not very interesting, sorry, Prague, but not very interesting alchemist museum there. And and in Vienna, you really have to, to search for any traces of that, just as an example, right? Mm. So the idea, that I had, and I'm also trying to do that with my podcast, is to bring European subjects, European tradition, a bit more back into those realms of the occult. And uh, it's not easy because for two reasons, A, you have to connect with people. And I would, if I may, Greg, say the same that I have said a couple of times on my introductions on my podcast. If there is anyone out there listening and interested who who lives around here where I live, and not just very close, but say in, in within the in the next two or three hundred kilometers around my place, Vienna, um, do let yourself know because I think it would be nice to to link up and to exchange ideas and to to talk and to see what also could be done practically in this part of the world. There have been very few reactions to those calls, but I could use more. But again, that I don't want to sound um, whatever uh, frustrated about it or so. It's just a task that I would like to keep going with. And I really like the idea that one could maybe bring part of that tradition back into our minds here. But then I'm extremely happy that three quarters of my audience of thought service comes from the US. So there you are. <laughs> well, yeah, there you are. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. I've always had like a penchant for that sort of thing here. Um, you know, not in the mainstream, but, you know, there's always been that un strong undercurrent of that is right from the get-go, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah. Rhode Island. Uh, yeah. You know, there's yeah. been uh, Pennsylvania, certainly, these ideas of religious freedom. And right, you had Kelpius and Bisol in Pennsylvania. So... Yeah, I think you said a crucial word, uh, that's religious freedom and freedom in general, freedom of thought in general. Of course, historically, this continent has gone through many very difficult periods for people who are free thinkers, starting far back, but also again, of course, in the 20th century. 
And not only that, not only free thinking was not possible in many regions, but also um, parts of the occult world were being taken hostage, one would say. The thought was taken hostage by certain currents you wouldn't like to be put in contact with. And of course, it needs time to to come back. I mean, you, you see it in other fields when I just may say that in a field like classical music, which I know very well professionally, uh, the classical music uh, after World War II in Germany is being influenced very much that destructive element that was probably needed to to bring classical music back in a new way. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't have happened like that in different political situations. So that these, like Stockhausen at the time said, how can you write tonal music after Auschwitz, you know? And somehow certain thought currents, and I believe parts of occultism suffered from that as well, at least for a certain time, and probably that time is now past. Um, but there was, of course, a historical context that didn't make it easy to continue along a given path. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, Rudolf, it's as always, it's been a pleasure and uh, wonderful to speak with you. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk a little bit more about yourself and your experience and your interests. And it's been really excellent. And uh, I hope that everyone else has enjoyed it as much as I have. Well, thank you. Hope so too. And uh, to me, it was a great pleasure to do that and to be able to do that. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and looking forward to do our next interview together again soon. Yeah, as am I. Thank you. In the Chamber of Reflection, we continue the interview with Rudolf Berger, delving into his association with the Fraternitas Saturni, his thoughts on the direction of his podcast, and his association with the work of Franz Barden, among other subjects. Join us for that fascinating conversation. And I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, it costs time and money to create. We ask you to support our efforts and the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com or subscribing via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks and I salute you. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.